Hi, my name is Sangay Chafel. I've been out of the country for the last 17 years, and now that I'm back, I want to rediscover my own country. That's the air of Hunsi Zonkag, the place where I was born. And I'm finally visiting my own Zonkag after 17 years, and I can't wait to explore Hunsi. Welcome back to another episode of Nigerian Express Travelogue. Today I'm visiting Hunti Zong, also known as Lele Zong. This zong has a rich history behind it and I want to go explore it. During the 1550s, it is said that while Nagyon Wanchu was meditating in the current site of the present Hunti Zong, the local deity of Hunti appeared to him in the form of a white goat. He took it as an auspicious sign and built a small temple in 1552 and called it Lele Zong, which means the fortress of the goat. A particular story also suggests that a stone below the Zong in the shape of a goat was heard bleating, alluding to the Zong's name and hence the Zong came to be known as Lele Zong. Oral traditions are quite fascinating, but historically the present Zong was constructed in 1654 by the first Penlok, Minjur Tempa, who headed to Kirte in an attempt to spread the Drupa rule in eastern Bhutan. He defeated Chokor Deb of Bumtong, who had most of eastern Bhutan under his control. The Zong then came to be known as Hindrup Rinchinse. So one cool fact about Hunzi Zong is that it used to be structurally divided into two parts, an upper and lower zong. Today they've built it into one whole piece. And these rocks behind me are there because of the earthquake from last year. They're still doing some major renovation and reconstruction. Another cool fact about this zong is that it holds 10 lagangs. And one of these lagangs holds the most sacred soaring statue of long life called Tepame. And that is the lagang where this sacred relic is held and I'm going to go visit there and check it out. Legend has it that a fisherman found a sacred statue of Tepame and kept it in killing Hagang. But the statue behaved most strangely. On more than one occasion, it is believed to have flown outside of the Hagang. The statue was then moved to Lhunsi Zong where this sacred statue found its home. So I've just come out from the resting place of the soaring statue, Sepame. And it is, it's a small statue, this extraordinary statue, uh, with so much myths and legends behind it. It's kept locked away in a, in a safety box. And what's presented is a replica of it. And uh, I think it's rightfully so that they should keep it safe uh, because it's an extraordinary statue and I had the privilege of um, having my eyes gazed on this extraordinary statue. So I'm very, very happy about that. Dunzi Zong was built as a symbol of defense as it is situated on top of the mountain. Now the Zong is the office of administration and the Drotsong for the monastic body. Today I'm at Puyum Higher Secondary School, now changed to Lunsi Higher Secondary School. 
and there's a bunch of students here and I want to ask them what's so special about Hunsi. So come on. So what's so special about Hunsi? Tell me about Hunsi. What's there to see? And is there some sacred place, some something special, a special village maybe? In our Hunsi Zongo, uh, there is uh, many villages uh, and in their village there are many uh, in Zonga, we call Ne, sir. Ne. Yes, sir. Sing is on me, the Lerin Chimumpani, the Jang Chumini, the Desha is here. I can't change. I can't change. So, got the Tang Machu, Tang Machu, the Koma, the Latimil, and the Silver. Can you please tell me about Lunti Zonka? This is my first time here in Lunti. What's special about Lunti? Important place is in Komala. Mm. There are. Uh, there are uh, which, which we call as uh, Kirala, this mm -hmm. Kishitara. Kishitara. Yeah. Tunsi Dzongkag is comprised of eight guilds, with majority of the people speaking the language of Kurtep. Other languages such as Zala and Chechen Lacha, a sister language to Dzongka is also spoken. Tunsi, like most of the eastern districts, it's completely influenced by Guru Rinpoche. His influence is seen as far as Singizong to pretty much every nooks and corners of Hunsi. So the great Guru Rinpoche has his influence all over Bhutan. And today I'm here in Takila, Hunsi, where it's the home of the biggest statue of Guru Rinpoche. And his influence are seen everywhere. And Hunsi is one of those places. I am visiting Koma village, the village where it is believed Guru's kingdoms resides. I've just entered the gates leading to the village of Koma, and what Koma is known for is Kishutara, a traditional, very detailed kira, which is supposed to be really, really beautiful. So let's go check it out. Kusampola. Koma is a small, prosperous village, illuminating with the vivid colors of Kishutara. The people are very friendly, and the kids are very playful. The vigor of youth puts a smile on my face, as they are very welcoming. Koma mainly thrives on Kishutara, with most women weaving this distinctive kiras throughout the day. Young girls are trained from an early age to perfect their skills since women are the breadwinners in this community. So I really want to find out more about Koma and Kishutara. So I'm going to meet a young girl from Koma. Her name is Tenzin Womo and she'll tell us more about Kishutara and Koma itself. So let's go. <laughs> Koma is placed beautifully between Yonglachu and Komochu. My village is the gateway to the sacred Singizo. In my village, we have about 20 houses and 175 people. The people in my village are hardworking, kind and helpful to each other. Komo was actually named as Komo because a long time ago when Guru Rinpoche was meditating around here, he saw a beautiful girl and took her as his condom, saying, Malu Koi Mochi Tu, coining the word Komo. It is still believed that there is always one woman from Koma who is a true condom. My small village is famous for its beautiful Kishtara. 
it is an old tradition passed on from our ancestors ni kan thik mala ni get kara kuchu chicken kan thik kan ge thik tar min ngam na kan thik kan ro kam pura chinga tang le apa mai tun bi dala my mother tells me that kishithara started becoming popular around the 1980s mapangi kishthara thik mala shinto shinto chinara ngai same ngili doctor be mala ko same na ko debes ninani ngai mla migam pole same te help be mai i love my village more than anything else in the world cause i was born here i have all my friends and family here and the people in my village are simple I think that makes my village the most beautiful village in the world. Wow, it's awesome how the women in Koma weave kishitara because the, the design is so intricate. It's beautiful. Then's in here she's been uh, she's been weaving since last summer. It's going to take her about 3 months, only 3 months to finish this gorgeous, beautiful looking kira. I wish her all the luck. This is going to be a wonderful thing. Koma is so beautiful. I'm so happy that I came to Koma. Las Denzen, na yasme tugush. So today I'm here at the GUPS office and uh I'm here with the ADM. Na yitenge chumala. Sange doji. Sange doji. Las la. So we had to get uh, the permission because the trail is very difficult and uh, there's uh, our royal army and the indian army there so we need permission to pass through this trail So I got my permission I have my guide uh and let's go to the lion's fortress because it's a long way there so let's get out of here Singe Zong is deemed as one of the most sacred sites in whole Bhutan as Guru Rinpoche meditated there during the mid 8th century. Singe Zong or the Lion's Fortress is 3 day walk from Koma. It is situated at more than 3000 meters above sea level. It is called the Lion's Fortress. because the very mountain where the main hagang lies is in the shape of a lion so we've been walking about 2 hours and it's really really hot i mean it's i can't even explain how hot it is i'm constantly sweating and it's crazy but we live in nami sami tetsu mamula ah today is the first day of my journey or rather my pilgrimage to singe zong ah <sighs> so after all that heat like i always say you got to enjoy the simple things in life and just a small breeze like this is so helpful <sighs> people also refer to singe zong as guru's paradise my guide tells me the journey is very difficult but once reaching singe zong it is supposedly very beautiful how ji ga da ya ji la da tu de shin be jin de the first day's journey will take me to a place called komagang it's about 9 hours walk my guide who's a messenger for the lama usually does this trek in about 4 hours Talk about a speedy messenger, huh? He walks in such a fast pace. I'm usually left behind, though I tried my best to keep up. So, we're finally at a place where we could see the first glimpse of Komagang. You can see a small house there. It's probably going to be about an hour to get there. So uh let's get going because it's about to get dark. It might even rain. 
So let's go. The first day's walk took us longer than anticipated. By the time we reached Komagang, it had become night. But luckily, it's a tradition to stay with a family of our horsemen, who were very hospitable. So I'm in Komagang. I'm here with Mr. Ugin. And what they do here in the village is, the village mainly survives on uh, maize, bamboo products. And the women here, uh, they sometimes weave kiras. Yes. <laughs> The morning in Komagang reveals such a beautiful village. This village is the last proper village in our trek to Singizong. Almost all the people from Komagang earn their extra money from hiring horses to and back from Singizong. As my horseman starts gearing up, I say to myself, it's a good thing I had a good night's sleep. So it's the second day of trek to Singizong, and uh, this trek is a bit shorter than the first day, but this trek is a lot more treacherous, it's a lot muddier. That's Lama. According to legend, in the mid 8th century, Guru Rinpoche attempted to suppress the demon king, Kikarato, who was exiled from Tibet. The demon king escaped the wrath of Guru Rinpoche and moved to Kempajong, where he supposedly established his demon kingdom. The great guru once again tracked the demon king down and finally suppressed the demon in Kempajong. Guru Rinpoche then traveled to Singizong for a deep meditation, accompanied by his beloved Kandum Yishe Tsogyal. Along the way, we pass a small settlement called Denchung, and the people treat us to some refreshing cucumbers. The second day's journey will take us to a place called Tankarmo, which is once again another nine hours of walk. Compared to the first day's journey, this journey is much tougher. The scariest part of the journey is that the path is destroyed by constant landslides. Crossing these particular stretches of path was heart pounding. You had to be very vigilant. The interesting thing about this journey is that you encounter countless amounts of man-made log bridges. The entire walk is always accompanied by the roaring komachu. It started to rain and uh, it's miserable. I just can't wait to uh, get to the second base. Because we were traveling during the wrong season, if the leeches didn't get you, it was the path that literally wore you out. We had to literally jump from rock to rock in order to avoid the mud. At times, it was much easier just to dive right into the mud without a care in the world. So I'm finally here at the second base. It's taken us a whole day. I am dead tired, covered with mud, 
My socks are soaking wet. All I want to do is go to sleep. Tunkermo is nothing more than a makeshift guest house, but at least it's dry and warm, which brings a certain comfort to the mind. So I'm here at Tunkermo, our second base camp. Last night, couldn't see anything. It was just rainy, muddy, and cold. Uh, it's still the same in the morning. But now that I'm seeing it, it's really, really beautiful. Today is the final journey to Sing It's Own. By the third day, it is literally difficult to even lift your legs to walk. But this trek is much shorter. It's about five hours walk. As we climb higher and higher, even the vegetation starts to change. It becomes much rockier as huge boulders are much more apparent. As we pass through the stone gates to Sing It Zong, the land just opens up as to welcome any visitors who dare to make it all the way here. So, after all that trekking, we finally get to see the first glimpse of Singhaizong and it's beautiful. Today it has an internal division of eight zongs. Among the eight zongs, Singhaizong is the main sacred place where Guru Rinpoche meditated. The area where Singhe Zong is located is truly comparable to a paradise. It is surrounded by high glacier peaks all around, which seems to be the source for Komachu. To my surprise, the eight zongs that make up this location are actually mountains and caves, with the exception of Singhe Zong and Gao Zong, which have been constructed with huggings. I'm meeting up with a caretaker who will tell me more on the sacred sites and especially about Singhaizong. So this is the main cave um, where um, Sing Zong actually gets its name from. Um, and it's a privilege for me to come here on this pilgrimage because it's, it's, it's a place that most people can't come uh, because they can't make it, because the, pilgrim, the journey itself is such a, such a harsh journey. But um, I feel very, very lucky because uh, this was the exact same spot where Guru Rinpoche himself and Kandum Yishe Togyao actually meditated here. So um, even um, coming from Tempu, uh, my friends, you know, they, they have sent offerings because they can't make it. So, so um, let me uh, say a prayer. I feel very blessed to have been in the very cave where Guru Rinpoche and Kendum Yishe Togyal actually meditated during the 8th century. It is a remarkable feeling. So once you reach Singhe Zong, it's a must that you have to go see the lakes. It's about a two hour walk, but uh, for a person like me, it would probably take me about four hours, but the locals, it usually takes them two hours. After having traveled all the way to Singhaizong, 
It's a piece of cake to hike up to Tok Up and Ton Up. Although the air here is very thin, and at times it's quite difficult to breathe due to the altitude. You must make sure to take it slow or suffer the wrath of altitude sickness. It is quite fascinating how we still keep this tradition of worshipping natural wonders as sacred sites and visiting these lakes has become somewhat of a religious experience for me. It's an experience which brings you closer to Mother Earth as well as God. Along the way, a family of nomad is camped out in a flat piece of land. This family of nomads are yak herders and sold yak products. They will soon travel towards the south as the cold winter arrives. My gratitude to the family for welcoming a complete stranger for a hot cup of tea. I really hope this tradition will live on forever. It truly makes you realize how tiny you are in this world, let alone this universe, and how precious life really is. Finally made it. Finally made it. This is the first lake. It's the Black Lake. And it looks gorgeous. The locals say this lake is very temperamental. Uh, fog, it, it just fogs up automatically out of nowhere. It's very, very temperamental, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy that I, I got, got here safe and sound, and I got to witness the lake, and uh, I'm even, even more exhilarated to go see the second lake. One peak after another, it seems like there's always another higher peak to reach. I can't believe I've reached the very source of Komachu, which we have been following since the start of our journey. I wish I had more time to take in all that Singizong has to offer and try to get spiritually closer to Guru Rinpoche, but my limited time requires me to travel further in search of other wonders. So my pilgrimage is about to come to an end and as we climb higher towards the White Lake, it feels like I'm literally on top of the world. So that lake right behind me is the White Lake and if you thought the Black Lake was uh, temperamental, this lake is even more temperamental because it's raining now and it's miserable really. It's cold, rainy and uh, it might even snow. Uh, but the journey up to, up to the White Lake was definitely worth it. Though the entire trek was unbelievably difficult, as my pilgrimage ends here by the White Lake, I am saddened in the thought of leaving this uncanny holy place and I know deep down in my heart that I will probably never make it back again. Gangzhou is located about 30 minutes drive from proper Hunsi. It is a small peaceful village situated literally on the side of a mountain with a handful of houses and green rice paddies which flutters in the winds. It truly looks like a scene right out of a movie. I'm in the village of Gangzur, and what Gangzur is famous for is for its earthenware. I'm going to a place where they make these earth pots and uh, we'll find out how it's made. <laughs> 
earthenware or sazam is a dying art. Today, few remaining women here in Gangsa actually still practice this particular art. This is a lot of fun actually. Ji ni su. So I'm feeling this clay here and it's uh, much more finer and softer now and uh, that's the reason uh, they pound the, the, the clay to make it soft and fine and uh, this, this is almost to a point where you can shape it the way you want it. This art of making pot is practically their livelihood. As a result of the help from Tariana, this art of making pots is heading in a strong path to recovery. It is amazing how these women makes it look so easy and perfect with their hands. They make about 30 pots every day and seven different types of pots. So Gongzhu earthenware is quite famous and uh, these ladies are actually keeping up this traditional life and I've actually read that these ladies are being sent to India for further training into refining their skills uh, of making these earth pots and I wish them all the best. Karinchela. Karinchela. Today, I'm heading towards Dunker, located 40 kilometers away from Lhunsi. Dunker is the home to Dunker Palace. This is the place where Jigmi Namgyo, the father of her first king, was born. But my true destination is Tenpe, or Daling, which is a few kilometers away from Dunker Palace. So today I'm here in Tinpe, in Dungar Gyeog, and I'm finally home. This is the place where I was born. Unfortunately, I don't have any memory of Dalling at all, but I can't wait to revisit my roots. It is a picturesque village with a handful of houses and rice fields stretching as far as the eye can see. So it's my last day here in Hunsi and Hunsi Zonkug. It's beautiful. It's an awesome Zonkug and it's my Zonkug and I can't wait to go see my grandmother. I don't want to waste any more of your time or my time. So, ladies. Dunsi is home to kings, paradise, and all the exquisite, wonderful things. The very mountain roars with the impending thunder of Guru's supremacy. The complexity of such unfathomable beauty woven within the kiras as it is fit for a kingdom. Mysterious natural wonders literally on top of the world. This is Tlunzi, the birthplace of many ancient traditions, kings and my home. So until next time, in another Zonkug, goodbye.